before we go into the parables, I just want to teach you this term in case you're not familiar with it. When people refer to the synoptic gospels, that means Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The reason they call the synoptic gospels is because you'll find that if you read them, a lot of them have got uh, very similar stories. But you'll find that the gospel of John is very different. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. And there you can see that nice diagram where uh, Matthew, 20% of his material is unique. Luke, 35% is unique. Mark, 3%. And then that shows the different parts where they've got overlapping stories. But you'll find uh, the book of John is very different. It was deliberate as well. John wrote his a lot later. And he deliberately wanted to cover material that hadn't been covered by the other gospels. Now, you'll find that there are no parables in the book of John. The parables of Jesus are all in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What we do, though, have in John, and I just want to mention this to you, is what we call allegories. Now, an allegory is when um, a story is used where people, where ideas are symbolized as people. So I just want to give you a few examples there. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. That's an allegory, okay? Not a parable, but uh, he's showing that as bread sustains our life, our physical life, so Christ sustains our spiritual life. He's using an allegory to teach a spiritual truth. I am the light of the world. The world is full of darkness. Now, it's obviously talking about spiritual darkness, and Jesus is the light. Jesus said, I'm the door of the sheep. And he shows that just as the shepherds would protect their, their sheep from the wolves by having a door, so he protects us. I am the resurrection and the life. Death is not the final word for those in Christ. So they all start with I am, the seven I am's. I am the good shepherd. Jesus is committed to caring for us and he treats us like his sheep. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's showing that he's the source of all truth, that just as you walk along a road, uh, he is the way that we must walk along. And then the seventh one, I am the true vine where he compares himself to being um, a vine. He says, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Okay, so in the book of John, we've got allegories, no parables, but we find the parables of Jesus in the synoptic gospels. Now, storytelling is a very ancient art. You'll find it in every culture. And storytelling paints pictures which people can listen to and remember. And parables are stories with hidden messages. Jesus wasn't just telling them stories because they wanted to hear a story and be entertained. He was teaching them spiritual truths. And so Jesus explained that his use of parables was twofold. The one was to reveal the truth to those who wanted to know it. And the other was to conceal the truth from those who were indifferent. So, firstly, the purpose of Jesus' parables to provoke the imagination and to allow us to see God's truth from a new perspective. He would tell stories. Because a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. We battle to understand heavenly truths, the spiritual truth. So Jesus would tell them stories they could understand. He told them stories about people farming, planting seed, people who were fishing, about kings and servants, and they could understand that. And then he would say, the kingdom of God is like that. And he would teach a spiritual truth. And it's a powerful way of, of teaching, even today uh, in ministry. It's always good if you can tell a story and then relate it to a spiritual truth. That's one of the purposes of parables. But the other one that Jesus said was to actually hide the truth from his enemies who were listening. And that was a prophetic fulfillment um, from Isaiah about people who were spiritually blind. And Jesus said the disciple, well, it says in Matthew 13, verse 10 to 14, that the disciples came to him and asked, 
Why do you speak to the people in parables? He said, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. And he says, um, this is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Now, you might say, but isn't that unfair? I mean, why was Jesus trying to hide the truth from some of these people? Does that mean that God chooses some people to be saved and other people's not to be saved? That's what the Calvinists teach. They say God chooses people. And the reason is no. It is because their hearts were calloused. And he says, for this people's heart has become callous. Callous means it's got hard. You know what a callus is? You know, when you get a callus on your hand, it gets hard from work. And then when you touch it, there's no feeling there. And he said their hearts were like that. They don't hear with their ears. They've closed their eyes. And so Jesus deliberately told parables also to conceal the truth from for those enemies. Because if he had told them in plain language, their judgment would have been increased because they rejected his message. And they would have just furthered their, uh, their judgment. You know, some people battle to understand that, um, you know, about the fact that God has foreknowledge. He doesn't predestine, but he has foreknowledge. He knows who will be saved. And obviously, God focuses his effort on those people uh, in the same way that Jesus focused on the people who would understand. Do you think if you've got a garden, are you going to go water the rock? You're wasting your time. You're going to go water the plants. And in the same way, Jesus... When he's here, he wants to water the plants, not the rocks. Okay, because God knows who will respond because of his foreknowledge. Doesn't mean he makes the choice for us. So parables are two, uh, two part. One, to teach spiritual truths to those um, who wanted to, uh, to listen and who believed and to hide them from those who had already hardened their hearts. Now, when you look at a parable, you must ask these questions. And this you can apply to any parable. What we did last year, unfortunately, we can't really do it this year because of the social distancing. We actually split the class up into groups and gave them different parables to discuss and what the meaning was. But when you come across a parable, always apply these questions. Firstly, ask, what is the context? That means don't just read the story. Read what happened before. Why did Jesus tell that story? And you'll find that often there's some introductory words before. So often Jesus would say th something like, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Uh, for example, in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, remember that's about the man who was proud and he prayed God and he, uh, to God and said, I thank you, I'm such a good man. And then the tax collector who wouldn't even look to heaven and he said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Before that parable, it says, then Jesus told the story to some who had great self-confidence and scorned everyone else. So it's telling you the, re the reason for the parable, that there were some people, like the Pharisees, who thought that they were fine with God, and they looked down on everybody else. And Jesus wanted to show with his story that that wasn't the case. Then the interpretation, you need to ask the question, what is the parable teaching? Remember, Jesus is not just telling us a nice story, it's teaching something. So you find that in the, sto uh, the story, there'll be different people, animals, maybe um, different things like a vineyard or money. You've got to ask, what do they represent? He's using physical things, but it represents something spiritual. Then compare the interpretation with other scripture. Jesus' parables will never contradict the rest of the word of God. Then you must be consistent in your interpretation. I would have liked to have used a nice example of this, but we don't have time, especially in the parables that we find in Matthew 13. The way people interpret them, they're very inconsistent. So if you find that there's a landowner in the one parable and he represents God, in the next parable, the landowner will still be God. If he says the field is the world, you'll find in the next parable, the field is still the world, but you find some people aren't consistent. They make, um, you know, the landowner God in the one parable, in the next parable, they want to, for example, make it Satan. 
You don't interpret parables like that. There are some parables Jesus explains. Remember the sower? The disciples came to him and they said, we don't understand it. He explained it. We need to use those interpretations as a basis for further interpretation. So especially when you look at the parables in Matthew 13, uh, you'll find that if we take that explanation of Jesus, it helps explain those other parables. So here's a very well-known parable, the parable of the sower. Matthew 13, the first one. Jesus told seven parables in this chapter, the seven kingdom parables. He started all of them. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is like this. The same day Jesus set, uh, went out of the house and sat beside the lake, such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Now you see, he's telling a story that they could understand because they know what it was like to plant seeds and how some of the seeds grew and some didn't. But what does it mean? And so they came and asked Jesus. And he said, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one, that's Satan, comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. That is what was sown on the path. So when the seed that fell on the path that the birds came and took away, he says, represents Satan stealing the seed. And I just want to mention this to you in passing. Later on in those parables, he mentions birds again. And we know from this parable that the birds must represent Satan. Some people make it represent something else. Yeah, he said the birds stealing the seed was Satan stealing the word of God. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. So he's comparing um, the seed that falls onto this ground. It doesn't have a good root. And it's like a person who becomes a Christian, he says they grow quickly. They don't have a deep root. But you know what happens when there's trouble comes, when there's hard times, they fall away because they don't have a root. When there's not a lot of water, they die. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. So here's a warning that he gives. When he speaks about the seed sown among the thorns, this seed... Uh, the plant that comes up is destroyed by the thorns. It's interesting to see what he calls the thorns, the cares of this world, the lure of wealth. Some people try to tell you that you, you know, sign of godliness is that you need to be wealthy. Jesus says that the, um, the attraction of wealth can actually choke the word and it yields nothing. The cares of this world, what's that? The cares of this world is just... It's not necessarily things that are evil. It's just making a living. Sometimes we get so caught up in our jobs and just, you know, making a living that it chokes the word. We get so busy. But he said, what was sown on good soil? This is the one who hears the word, understands it, and who bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another 60 and in another 30. So Jesus is teaching that the sign of good soil is that you bear fruit. So if you're good soil for God, you should be bearing fruit. You should be bringing forth fruit. That's the only sign of good soil. 
are we bearing fruit? So there, I've just put it in a table. In this parable, Jesus tells us what the symbols are. So we don't have to try and interpret. He, he says the sower is himself, the son of man. He said the field is the world. And again, you'll find that in the other parables in Matthew 13, where it mentions the field, the field will always be the world, as he said yeah. The seed is the word of God. That's what Jesus said. And the birds, as I mentioned, are Satan. He talks about um, the seed that's divided by the birds as being the seed that um, the, the people where the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. The rocky ground, he says, refers to people who don't have a deep root and they fall away from serving the Lord when there's trouble or persecution, when things get a bit hard and they don't want to serve God anymore because they don't have a root. The thorns, as I've just told you as well, are the cares of this life, which Jesus said are life's worries, riches. So he says riches can choke the seed of God. Pleasures, they do not mature. So people who chase riches, and some Christians do, and they chase pleasure, Jesus said they're immature, they're babies, baby Christians. But the good soil, he said, is the sons of the kingdom. Those who not only hear the word, they understand it, and they produce a crop. Are you producing a crop? Then you're good soil. Do you want to stop serving God when things get hard? Then you don't have a, a proper root. Are you so caught up with making a living and trying to get rich that you don't have time to do the things of God? Well, then you've got thorns choking the seed. So a parable is an earthly story that teaches a spiritual truth. Let me skip through that because we've pretty much covered that. The hidden treasure. There's two parables in your notes where I'm going to disagree on the interpretation they put there. But I want to tell you what's in your notes. Many people have that idea uh, about the, the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. I believe they interpret them incorrectly. But a lot of people do that. They make the same mistake. And I think they make the mistake because they're not consistent. Remember I told you a parable can never be teaching something that contradicts the, uh, the rest of the word of God. When you ask most people, what is the pearl of great price? They'll say the pearl of great price is Jesus. Now it's true, Jesus is precious. When it talks about the hidden treasure, they'll say that must be Jesus. But is that what this parable is teaching? The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. So this man finds the treasure. He doesn't own the field. So what he does, he hides it again. And then he goes and sells everything so that he can buy the field. Why does he buy the field? Because he knows there's a treasure there. There's a hidden treasure. Now, your notes say this. Your notes say, when we truly accept the word in our lives, we will give up everything for Jesus. And that's what a lot of people think this parable is about. They say that we that man, and we need to sell everything we have to follow Jesus, give up everything. Now, maybe there's a bit of truth in that, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not saying he's the treasure, and we're not the man. We must interpret scripture with scripture. Remember the previous parables? What was the field? The field was the world in the first parable. So the field here is the world. Who was the man in the previous parables? You had the man sowing. He said that was himself. He said the son of man. So the man is not us. The man is Jesus. Think about it. 
The man sells everything he has to purchase the field, which is the world. Did you sell everything you had to buy the world? No. But Jesus, it said in Revelation 5 verse 9, with your blood, you purchased men for God. We purchased nothing. Jesus purchased the world. So what is the treasure? The treasure is us. Isn't that a beautiful uh, picture? It's shown that the man is Jesus. The field is the world we know from the previous parables. And it says that he bought the world so that he could obtain a treasure. And that treasure is us. Acts 20 verse 28 says, Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Jesus bought the world, not us. The interesting thing there, it says that when the man found the treasure, he hid it again. So what does he do? He left the treasure in the world. The treasure is us, the church, and he leaves the church in the world. But he's going to come fetch it later once, you know, he's wrapped up all he has to do in his father's house. And that's why he says in John 17, just before he's about to go to the cross, when he prays to his father, he says, I will remain in the world no longer. He left it. But they are still in the world. Who? His treasure, us, his disciples. And I'm coming to you. He asked God to protect his disciples because he says, I'm leaving them behind in the world. And that man left the treasure behind. And it says he sold all that he had and bought that field. Isn't it interesting? It shows that he didn't just buy the treasure. He bought the whole field so that he could get the treasure. And that's what the Bible teaches is that Jesus' blood paid for the whole world. Even though not everybody will accept him, he potentially died for everyone. If everyone believed, everyone would be saved. And that's why it says in 1 John 2 verse 2 that Jesus is the atoning sacrifices for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus bought the whole world. The field is the world. The man sold all he had and bought the world. Why? So he could get the treasure. We are the treasure. He bought us. So that's what the parable is teaching. It's not teaching about us giving up stuff to get Jesus. It's talking about Jesus buying us with his blood. If we're consistent. And it says that in his joy, he sold all that he had. He was actually joyful about selling everything so that he could get that treasure. And you know, that's what it says about Jesus. It says that Jesus endured the cross with joy. You know why? Because he knew he was purchasing a treasure. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right end of the throne of God. It says that the cross, he scorned it because he knew by going to the cross, he was going to purchase that treasure, gave up everything he had to buy the world. It's the same with the pearl. So I don't agree with the interpretation there, but it's a common interpretation. A lot of people say that. But it's not, not correct. It's not consistent with the rest of scripture. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. The same thing. So people say, pearl of great price, that must be Jesus. We must give up everything to get Jesus. No, we don't buy Jesus. Jesus buys us. Okay, so I hear some people say, I was, you know, I found the Lord. The Lord was never lost. Okay. The Bible tells me that Jesus found you. The lost sheep. It says the shepherd went and found the sheep. So it's not correct really to say I found the Lord. He wasn't lost. You were lost. <laughs> okay. So it's pretty much the same as the hidden treasure. Uh, so the notes say this is the same as the parable of the hidden treasure. That's correct. But they say when we truly accept the word of God in our lives, we will give up everything for Jesus. Now, as I say, in a sense, that's true, but that's not what this parable is about. The merchant is not a lost man seeking salvation. In harmony with the other parables, the man in the parable is Jesus. Remember, the man is always Jesus in those parables. He sold everything he had and bought. We didn't sell everything we had to buy Jesus. 
In contrast, it says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20, you are not your own, you were bought at a price. We didn't buy Jesus, he bought us. So the merchant is Jesus. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. The pearl shows that we are precious to God. Jesus says we like a pearl. In Jeremiah 31 verse 3, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. We are precious to God. We are pearl. A pearl so precious that Jesus said, I'm going to sell everything I have. Give up everything. Lay down my life so I can get that pearl. Because he says we are precious to him. That's what those parables are about. And that's consistent with the rest of scripture. The dragnet. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets but threw the bad away. Now, Jesus actually explains it. He says, this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come, so the fishermen are like the angels. They will separate the wicked from the righteous, so separating the fish. And he says they will throw them into the fiery furnace where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So again, that's another nice parable because Jesus explains it to, uh, to us. So, let's... Skip over that. I'm just giving you a few examples so that you can apply this yourselves. I've already told this to you. I hope you still remembered in a previous lesson. So again, we're just going to skim through these. Remember I told you the parable about the tenant farmers when we spoke about the kingdom of God? The guys were supposed to give the produce to the master. They never did. He sent his servants. They beat them up. Eventually he sent his son and they killed the son. And then he came and he punished them. He told about the marriage feast, the king who invited people to the feast for his son, and the people who invited didn't come, so they invited the beggars. And then he told about the two sons, the one who said, I will obey, and didn't, and the one who said, I won't obey, and did, and the unfruitful tree. In all of those, we saw, so I'm not going to go through that, that again, that that spoke about the fact that the kingdom of God was offered to the Jews, and they rejected it. Here is your king, said Pilate. We have no king but Caesar. And so the kingdom, remember, was taken and given to the Gentiles. That's what they were all about. The Good Samaritan. There's a well-known one. Eh? What is the context? People know the parable, but they don't know the context. The context is that there was an expert in the law who stood up to test Jesus. And he said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. So that's a summary of the law of God, to love God and to love your neighbor. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But then we told that the man wanted to justify himself and say, so he said, who is my neighbor? So remember, he had said, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor. Why did he say, who is my neighbor? He wanted to know, is my neighbor everyone in the world? Or is my neighbor just my friends? Or maybe people who belong to the same culture? Because remember, they lived in a culture where uh, they had the Romans oppressing them. And a lot of them hated the Romans. So were the Romans their neighbors? They had these people called the Samaritans there that they didn't like them. They were a different race. So there was also racism in those days. Were the Samaritans their neighbors? And you know, we're going to see from the parable that Jesus told Jesus when he answered his question, he told him a parable. So the man said, who is my neighbor? Who is this neighbor that I must love? Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Now, do you know that in the Old Testament, it never says hate your enemy. 
The Old Testament, Leviticus 19, verse 8, go check it out, just says, love your neighbor as yourself. You know what the people of Jesus day did? They added that bit. They said, love your neighbor, but you can hate your enemy. So the way they got around it, they said, well, not everybody's my neighbor. So I can love my neighbor, but I don't have to love the Romans. They occupy in our country. We don't like them. I don't have to like the Samaritans. They're a different race. We don't like them. So they redefined who their neighbor was. So they said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But God's word had only said, love your neighbor. And that's why that man asked the question. Love the Lord your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor. He said, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells him a story about the good Samaritan. The Samaritans was a race a different, that they despised. The Jews despised them. And the hero of his story is the Samaritan. And he says a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Now, this is a religious leader. He's supposed to be helping people. He sees this man, a Jew, an Israelite. He walks on the other side, doesn't want to help him. So to a Levite, okay, the Levites also, they were the guys who studied the law, and, uh, you know, part of the priesthood as well. When he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, but a Samaritan, now remember the Samaritan, they were different race that the Jews didn't like these people. So you'd think this guy wouldn't want to help him, eh? But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, that's money, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And then Jesus says to this man, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Who is my neighbor? Is my neighbor just my fellow Jews, just my friends? You know, Jesus said, no, the Samaritans, they're your neighbors too. The Romans, they're your neighbors. So when it says, love your neighbors yourself, if when I'm told love my neighbor, it doesn't just mean I like only people who like me or my friends. It means we love all people, even different races. John 4 verse 9 said, Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Remember, they were, the disciples were surprised because they came and they found Jesus was sitting at the well with a Samaritan woman. And they thought, what's happening here? You know, you're not supposed to talk to those people. Why is Jesus, you know, sitting with this woman? And so what is the parable teaching? The injured Israelite and the Samaritan are shown to be neighbors. They're supposed to be enemies. According to everybody, Jews don't associate with Samaritans because they're different races. But Jesus shows that the command to love your neighbor includes people of different race who are considered to be enemies. We can learn a lot from that, especially in our country where we have a lot of racism. But you get racism everywhere in the world. And Jesus showing your neighbor is people of different races, people from different countries. The foreigner who comes here from another country, he's your neighbor. The unforgiving servant. Again, let's look at the context. You're probably familiar with it, but this is the context. The context is that Peter asks Jesus a question. He says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Uh, against me? Up to seven times? Now, you've got to understand, Peter thought he was being quite generous. Imagine if your brother, and by brother it means anybody, really, or remember your neighbor, comes and seven times they do something wrong to you. And every time you forgive them, you think, well, that's quite a lot. So Peter's saying, shall I forgive them seven times? 
Jesus said, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. And then he tells a story. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. It's a lot of money. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. So this man was going to be sold into slavery. The servant fell on his knees before him. He said, be patient with me and I'll pay, I'll pay back everything. And it says that the servant's master took pity on him. And you know what? He canceled the debt and let him go. So you don't have to pay it back. There's big debt, a lot of money. And he cancels the whole debt. But the story doesn't end there. That servant, it says, went out and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. So this guy didn't owe him a big amount like he owed the master. It was a small amount. But it says he grabbed him and began to choke him. And he said, pay me back what you owe me. And this man also said, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But it says he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Now, if you hear that story, you think this is a terrible person. He's just been forgiven this big amount of money. So he doesn't have to go to prison. And then this other guy owes him not such a lot and he won't forgive him. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. And he said, you wicked servant. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? What is Jesus teaching? What, did the, what is the question that Peter asked him? Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times. And it says that in anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. So basically now the man has to pay the debt back that was canceled because he refused to forgive someone else who owed him. And you know what Jesus says? This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Jesus is teaching us that God's forgiveness is conditional. If you're not prepared to forgive other people when they sin against you, it says God will not forgive you. Some people think, well, if I ask God to forgive me, he'll always forgive me. No, unless you forgive your brother, it's conditional. You know how Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father in heaven, Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And then Jesus said, for if, if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But listen to this part. He said, if you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. So if you've got someone that you're not prepared to forgive, God's not going to forgive you. That's what Jesus taught. And that's what the parable taught. And that's what Jesus says yeah, when he taught us to pray. God's forgiveness is conditional. God has forgiven you a great debt. You owed a great debt and he forgave you. And now you're going out and there are people who owe you a small debt and you won't forgive them. You say, I won't forgive that person. The prodigal son. What's the context? It says that the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around, around here, Jesus. Now, in those days, the tax collectors were hated. I know people hate the tax collectors today, but this was a, these guys were cheats. Okay, they were not only charging the tax they were supposed to, they were charging extra. And um, they were hated. And that's why it says the tax collectors and the sinners. These were people that were despised, but they were coming to hear Jesus. And this used to offend the religious leaders that the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they were saying, why? This man's a prophet. Why does he want to mix with people like that? 
And it says that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. They were disgusted. How can he eat with a tax collector? How can he talk to a prostitute? And Jesus answers by telling three parables. The first one is the parable of the lost sheep. Remember the man who left the 99 to go find the one that was lost? He talks about the parable of the lost coin. That's the woman who had 10 coins. She lost one, but she searched her whole house to find that one coin. And then last, he tells the parable of the lost son. In each of those, he's again showing something that we are precious. The lost sheep, the sinner, is precious to God. Even though there's 99 sheep that haven't wandered, he goes after the one lost sheep. That woman looks for the one out of the 10 coins that's missing. And here we find the father showing love to the son who had turned his back on him and run away and squandered his, his inheritance. And that's why Jesus goes, and he, now remember, they've just said, how can he talk to sinners? How can he talk to tax collectors? And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, Give me my share of the estate. So you were saying, you know the money I'm going to get when you die? Well, give it to me now while you're still alive. So it says he divided his property between the sons. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and he set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. He wasted it all on getting drunk and prostitutes, it actually says. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the, that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field, fields to feed pigs. Now remember that to the Jews was something terrible. Remember the pig was an unclean animal. They weren't even allowed to eat pork. And here's this man, he's an Israelite, and he's having to feed the pigs. For them, that was the the worst job he could be doing. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. He was so hungry he wanted to eat the pig's food. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. He said, let's have a party. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. So they began to celebrate. Now, all of those parables, you remember Jesus told three, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Their stories about recovering something that is precious, that is lost. So again, Jesus is showing that the sinner that is lost is precious to him. Something precious. And so these tax collectors, the prostitutes, the sinners, that the Pharisees said, why does he even talk to them? Jesus saying they're precious. You know, Jesus goes to the house of a tax collector called Zacchaeus. And again, they can't understand why is he going to a sinner? And you know what he answered? He said, the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Now, most of us are familiar with that. We, we understand that the prodigal son is a picture of us. We wander from God 
And, but when we realize I've wandered from God, we come back and he loves us and he greets us with open arms. But the story doesn't end there. Remember who Jesus was speaking to? He was speaking to the Pharisees. These were people who were saying to him, how can you talk to sinners? And so Jesus goes on with his story and he tells about the other son. He said, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. And the servant said, now your brothers come back and they're having a party. <laughs> and says the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. And so Jesus was showing that the attitude of the Pharisees was like that older son. That older son was saying, but I've served you. I've been good. You know, I've stayed at home the whole time. Now, why are you being kind to this brother of mine? Well, he doesn't even say this brother of mine. He says, this son of yours. That's interesting. He says, this son of yours, not my brother. And so the symbols, the father represents God. The younger prodigal son represents the tax collectors and the sinners that Jesus was reaching out to. But the older son is a picture of these self-righteous Pharisees that Jesus was addressing. And a lot of people forget that part of the parable. And the first part's important as well, that God loves the sinner. But the other part is also important, that we mustn't be self-righteous. We mustn't be angry when God shows mercy to those who are sinners. And that's how the Pharisees were. They were cross because Jesus was talking to sinners. And so the son says to his father, all these years I've been slaving for you. and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. And he says, but when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you killed a fattened calf for him. He's saying he's a terrible person. How can you now, you know, throw a party for him and put this nice coat on him? And that is typical of the self-righteous Pharisees. Rather than rejoicing, you know, the father says to him, he says, your, you know, your brother was lost and he's found. You know, um, he should have been happy. It was his brother who had come back home. You know, you'd think that he'd be happy. And rather than rejoicing that the sinners were coming to Jesus, the Pharisees were angry. They were angry that Jesus was talking to, uh, to sinners. And so the father says, my son, you're always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours, see, he said, this son of yours, he says, he's your brother, don't forget. <laughs> this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. Don't be angry when Jesus reaches out and saves the sinners. And so grace, the grace of God, is given at his discretion. The older brother felt that he deserved God's favor, just like the Pharisees. They felt that God, you know, should treat them well. The younger son expects nothing when he comes home. He doesn't even want to be a son. He actually says, make me like your servant. But the father welcomes him as a son. And so you find this as a common theme in Jesus' parables, that the grace of God is something that upsets human notions about merit. We like to think sometimes that we earn God's forgiveness, that God forgave us because we are so good. No, God gives grace to the undeserving. Okay, we're going to have to pick up the pace a bit. Yeah. The parable of the ten virgins. Okay, so I won't read you the whole thing. You should be familiar with this. Remember Jesus, um, you know, speaks about the ten virgins who go out to meet the, the bridegroom. Five were foolish, five were wise. And remember, the foolish ones had their lamps, but they didn't have any oil. And the wise ones had oil with them. And what happened, the bridegroom took a lot longer to come than they expected. And when eventually at midnight, the bridegroom comes, these foolish virgins realize that they don't have oil. And they ask the other ones, give us some of your oil. 
And they tell them, we don't have enough. You have to go buy some. And so they go right now in the middle of the night to go try to buy some oil. And while they're gone, we find that those virgins were let into the wedding banquet and says, and the door was shut. And when the others come back and say, open up the door, we know what happens. They're told, I don't know you. And then Jesus says, therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. What is he talking about? Well, again, if you look at the context, Jesus is talking about the end times. His disciples have just asked him when is going to be the end of the age. What will be the sign of your coming? And Jesus answers with this parable. So we know that the bridegroom represents Jesus. Okay. When is Jesus coming? We don't know. It says the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And it was the same with these virgins. They didn't know when the groom was coming. But they had to be prepared. Some of them were prepared. Others were not. Just uh, for information's sake, the ten virgins aren't wives, by the way. Because remember the Bible, and especially in the New Testament, um, you know, it teaches that, you know, we should have one wife, not ten wives. So, so when it's talking about the ten, it's actually referring to the bridesmaids. Okay, they were part of the bridal party. And Jesus says in Luke 21 verse 36 that we must stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of the Man, the Son of Man, what is Jesus teaching in that parable is that we need to be prepared. We don't know when the bridegroom is coming. We need to make sure that when he comes, we're ready. We can't suddenly at the last minute want to go buy oil in the middle of the night. So in the same way, we need to be ready for the coming of Jesus because we don't know when he's coming. He told many parables to tell us that we don't know the day that he's going to come. So the thrust of the parable is that Christ will return at an unknown hour and his people must be ready. We're probably only going to have enough time for one more. The talents. Again, this is a well-known one. Once again, the context is about the end times. So it's in the same setting uh, when Jesus tells the parable. The disciples have asked Jesus, when, what are going to be the signs that you come in again? What is the sign of the end of the age? And so, in this parable, we'll find that the symbols, the master is Jesus and we the servants. The talents that the master gives out represent the resources that he's given us. He's given us all resources. He's given us skills. He's given us money. He's given us time. And some have more and some have less. And you find the same in this parable. It will be like a man going on a journey. That man is Jesus, who called his servants. That's us. And entrusted to them his property. So he's given us his abilities and resources. To one he gave five talents, to another two, each according to his ability. So it tells me that some people have got more, some have got less. We mustn't be angry with the guys got more. Uh, we all are going to be judged on what we've got. The guy who got the five talents put them to work and he made five more. You know the story, I'm sure. But the guy who only got one, he went and dug in the ground and he hid his master's money away. Did nothing with it. He hid his talent. And it says that after a long time, the master came back. That's when Jesus comes again. Because the context is about the coming of Jesus to settle accounts. And there's going to be a day when Jesus is going to come again. And when he does, he's going to call us in and he's going to say, I gave you this talent. I gave you this money. What did you do with it? I gave you this time. What did you do with it? And we are going to have to account for what we've done with the time, the money, the talents that God has given us. Have we done nothing with them or have we used them for the kingdom of God? And so the man with five says, you gave me five and I've made five more. And the master's happy. He says, well done, you know, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. 
pretty much the same of the guy who got two. He'd also made two more. So he had less, but he still put it to work. And he also gets commended. The guy got one talent came forward and he said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So he's basically insulting his master. He's saying, you're unfair. You, you know, you, uh, you're a hard man. And he said, because of that, I was afraid. And so I did nothing with what you gave me. Because you're a hard man. And he gives him back. He says, yeah, this is what's yours. And master says, you wicked and slothful. That's lazy. He says, you're lazy. You lazy. And then he uses his own words against him. Doesn't mean that the master was like that. He says, okay, you say I'm hard. So he said, if I am hard, then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my, uh, my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one, uh, to him who has 10 talents. Jesus said, for to everyone who has will be give, more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's just quickly look at that parable in summary. What is it teaching? The gifts we have come from God and they belong to God. We are just managers. Everything we have belongs to God. It wasn't their property. It was the masters. He gave it to them. He entrusted them his property. So if you've got talents, the time you have, the money you have, it's not yours. It was given to you by God. And one day you're going to have to answer to him with what you did, with what he gave you. We've got different gifting. We saw you don't have to be like someone else. One guy had five, the other had two, the other had one. You mustn't say, well, I've only got one and that guy's got five. You know, I can't do anything. God wants us to use what we've been given. He expects a good return on his, his investment. Even if the guy who only had one, he said, you, have, you ought to have invested what I gave you. God will hold us accountable. And that's what Jesus is teaching. When the master comes back, the return, he's going to call us in and we will either be rewarded, well done, my good and faithful, faithful servant, or we will, uh, we will be punished. Well done, my good and faithful servant. A lot of people don't realize that God is not going to say well done unless we've done well. So we need to be very careful how we live our lives because there's going to come a day when God is going to ask us what we've done with what he gave us. God isn't interested in excuses. And so what does this man do, the, the, the one we want? He gives excuses. He says, you know, you were a hard man. And, um, you know, I was afraid of you. He's giving a whole lot of excuses. So a victim mentality won't cut it with God. You know, he says, I was afraid. That's why I did nothing. God, I was afraid. I was a victim. And then blaming God for your laziness is probably not a good idea. He not only did nothing, he blames the master. So it's like us blaming God. He says, um, you know, it, it's because you hard that I was afraid. So it's actually your fault that I did nothing. And you get people who try to blame God for their problems. And then it teaches us that playing it safe is the equivalent of doing nothing. He just buried his talent. And the master says, you, you're not only wicked, he says, you're lazy. <laughs> wicked and lazy. So the teaching is we must not neglect the gifts God has given us and the resources he's given us. You either use it or you lose it. Remember, you didn't use it. So what did the master say? He said, take it from him and give it to the guy with 10. Then it teaches us if you're faithful in little, you'll be entrusted with much. His master said to him, so this is one of the good servants, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. If we're not able to be faithful with worldly riches, 
If we're not able to be faithful in this world with the talents God has given us, he's saying, how can I entrust you with greater riches in his kingdom? And that's it. We managed to cover everything. Sorry, I went a bit fast at the end, but the point I'm trying to make on all these things is don't just regard them as stories and don't take them on their own. Look at the context. I've demonstrated, I've tried to take ones that are, you know, maybe more well known to demonstrate the point. Always look, was there a question asked before, like that one when Peter says, you know, must I forgive? How many times must I forgive my brother? What is the situation, uh, you know, when he tells the one about, um, um, you know, the prodigal son? We find it's because the people, the Pharisees are despising the sinners. And they're saying, how can he associate with sinners? And so he tells that parable to teach the point. Always look, um, you know, at the context. And that you do, by the way, with uh, all, uh, everything in the Bible, not just parables. A lot of people take a verse out of context and they try to teach something from it. Look at the verse before and look at the verse afterwards. Look at the whole passage, in fact. And then you also got to look at it in the context of the whole Bible as well, because the Bible doesn't contradict itself. And um, always be consistent. As I pointed out uh, to you, those, those two parables where people, I think, are, are inconsistent is the pearl of great price and the hidden treasure. If you take it in the context of the whole of Scripture, the man in both those parables is Jesus, not us. And the treasure is us, which is, is a wonderful, wonderful, um, you know, truth. The fact that Jesus regards us as a treasure. And we see that again in the lost sheep. That lost sheep is precious to him. He goes and at great risk goes and searches for the sheep. We find that the son who had sinned, who had squandered his money, was precious to the father. Even though he said, make me a servant, he said, no, you're my son. Come in. So these parables like, uh, you know, teach us how precious we are in God's sight, even if we are sinners. So apply that to the rest of the parables. When you come across a parable, don't just read it. Always ask yourself, what is Jesus teaching? What is the context? What does this teach me? It's a story. I understand the story, but what spiritual truth is it teaching? Amen. It's, um, well, it's um, closing prayer. We, our time is up. And um, next week we're going to be st uh, starting uh, eschatology. That's the study of prophecy of end times. But I trust that you've, you've learned something from this and that um, you'll be challenged now to go read some of those parables that before you didn't understand and ask what do they mean and get the spiritual truth from them.